three, two, one. Hello, culinary adventurers, and welcome to the Let's Dig In podcast. I'm your host, Chef Rich Rosendell, alongside my brilliant co-host, Ian Navarro. And today, in episode 55, we slice into a topic that is as crucial as it is overlooked, mental health. In this episode, we're joined by two culinary titans, Brother Luck, a restaurateur and top chef sensation, alongside Chef Michael Matarazzo, the mind behind Be Better Life and Leadership Coaching. They're both here to share their profound insight on nurturing the mind and the spirit in the high-pressure kitchen environment. A heartfelt thanks goes out to our sponsors who fuel our journey, Dry Ager for revolutionizing meat aging, uh, Ovention Oven for innovating cooking solutions, and a special nod to Waring Commercial, whose pivotal role in launching our first fully electric kitchen concept in Atlanta has set a new standard for the industry. Your support is the backbone of our culinary conversations. So prepare for a heartening dive into the stories and solutions at the intersection of culinary art and mental wellness, all served up with the expertise and empathy of our esteemed guest. So let's dig in episode 55. All right, here we are diving into another episode of the Let's Dig In podcast and, uh, Super excited today. We're going to do a little something a little bit different. We're going to go down the angle of uh, mental health and culture in the kitchen. Uh, we handpicked two really uh, great guests that we think uh, can offer some really unique insight on these subjects. Um, first off, uh, Mike Matarazzo. Uh, Mike, you and I have spent time together at the Greenbrier and cooking competitions over the years. Um, and of course, uh, Brother Luck, who I was introduced to. Um, to everything that you do out at Chef's Roll uh, last year. And if you guys, uh, and of course, Ian, uh, who joins me again as a co-host, we wanted to let you guys, for those viewers that may not be familiar with what you do and where you're located, uh, if you can maybe just kind of give us a little bit of an intro and your background, and uh, we'll go ahead and start with you, Brother Luck, and uh, kick things off. Yeah, well, first off, thanks so much for having me on. My name is Brother Luck. That is 100% my real name. Some cool things you just can't make up. Uh, <laughs> chef, owner, author, all of the above, but most importantly, uh, mental health advocate uh, here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. So uh, just living up here in the Rockies and uh, trying to make a difference, you know, one word and one plate at a time. Very cool. Mike? Yeah, uh, thanks, Rich. I um, so I'm I'm an executive chef uh, at a private club in Virginia. Um, been here down in Virginia for about ten years. Uh, I think it was 2020. Um, I started to also focus on the mental health aspect of things as a result of my own uh, kind of experience with with some mental health uh, events. Uh, so in 2020, I started a uh, life and leadership coaching practice. Uh, where I work with clients one-on-one -on -one and in group settings and help different businesses create positive culture and assess interpersonal communications between team members and kind of try to help uh, increase levels of positive, effective communication between them. And um, yeah, happy to be here. Happy to, uh, happy to keep talking about this topic. Well, I guess uh, it actually too, uh, uh, Brother Luck, that was going to be one of my questions. I was super curious if uh, if that was your your real name, which is uh, which which is awesome. Uh, so I'll I'll take that off the uh, question list here. Uh, but I'm I, I want to you know a lot of chefs and uh, you know brands and companies. You know, a lot of times people take like a very a, a certain angle uh, of maybe it might be some you know you might be in the culinary industry, but there might be something that's a, a passion or something that is a draw. Uh, and in your cases, um, you know, mental health and culinary culture, which is a really important topic. But I'm curious, is was there a moment in your career where that you felt that mental health was a significant um, component? That was there something that you per each of you both personally experienced that kind of sent you down the runway of, of like, hey, I want to I want to make a difference or there needs to be an impact in this particular area? What prompted it? Well, for me, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned an event, a mental health event, uh, and not to get too deep in the weeds with it, 
Uh, you know, I was, I was competing for a long time, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, I worked for a lot of certified master chefs in my career. Uh, that was kind of where I thought I needed to go in, in my life. Um, and I, I learned from, you know, going through the process, uh, going to the certified master chef exam and experiencing a pretty significant mental breakdown during the exam. Uh, you know, it kind of made me back up and reflect on how I was preparing for that and how I've been wired to train for things and, and keep my head down and push myself and, and, you know, tunnel vision, uh, without really listening to my body or myself. And although it had been successful in my past and earlier in my career, uh, it ultimately destroyed me during this particular experience. And then when COVID hit, uh, and I became a nine to five chef, like, like a lot of people did, which was kind of nice to be honest. Uh, you know, I, I figured instead of using my continuing education for food stuff, uh, you know, what does my team need more than anything? And, and society was spiraling and, and, and we were all spiraling to some degree, I think during COVID. Uh, so I decided to become a certified life coach for my team. And through that, I saw the benefits of it and saw that I could have potentially a more global reach, uh, with, with the knowledge that I had gained and, and my experiences and the fact that I'm really open about it. Uh, the more I talk about my challenges, the more I feel better. You know, I, I think it's, you, you hit something spot on. And I think a lot of us as chefs, especially, we put ourselves in these situations where we are extremely competitive. We are being vulnerable. We are being judged. And it creates this perfect environment, this perfect storm to where you have the potential to break. And as you break, as many of us do, that's when the realization comes that I've got to make some changes. And I, I heard somebody share this with me, you know, hurt people hurt people. And when we think about our industry, you know, that, that resonated pretty hard for me, um, you know, to actually jump off the deep end, right? We, we're just going to go right into 7.30 on a Valentine's night, but essentially, for me, what it was, was 2018, I was filming my second season of Top Chef and I got hit with this crazy environment that just triggered everything that I had locked away for, you know, 20 plus years. You know, all the, the neglect and the abuse and the struggle, all of that was triggered in this environment. And I tried to take my own life that night. And when wow. I woke up, the next morning and survive that moment, the shame was so hardcore because I saw myself in the reflection of the mirror that I was laying next to. And that was one of those moments of like, I got to get out of here. You know, not a lot of people know why I left the show the way I left the show that second season, but that's why I needed to take care of me. I needed to choose me and I needed to work on myself so I could, you know, better lead others. And I think as, as chefs, as owners, we're in charge of so many people. We're setting an example. It's one of those pieces of we have to focus on ourselves first and foremost before we can help anyone else. And, you know, the one thing that, especially after talking with, um, listening to both of you uh, and, and other people that I've talked with, I think that um, it takes a lot of courage for somebody to kind of come to terms and share with someone that maybe there's something that they're having a hard time coping with. But the reality is, I mean, I feel like that at all levels, um, there's kind of different, you know, it, it, there could be a little trigger that could just push somebody over the edge where maybe they don't realize, but they're in a really stressful situation, but it's a very, it could be a very fine line that can really push somebody to the edge where they're considering doing, you know, something, you know, very awful. Um, and I just feel like kitchens over the years have been like prime for that kind of environment. Um, what, what do you think like in the culture of kitchens in the industry, how do you think that that has kind of contributed to, uh, you know, men mental health, uh, conditions with chefs? Um, you know, we've all heard the stories and kind of joke about, you know, different, uh, you know, the, the chefs throwing pans and stuff like that. But what do you think like the real um, impact, um, you know, the real culture of, of kitchens? Like how has that kind of contributed to uh, mental health? 
Well, I think, I think the biggest piece is, is we have a shift in generation, right? We have all of these different age groups working together that come from completely different backgrounds. You know, when you look at a, a baby boomer versus a Gen Z, they're, they're in the same workplace right now. So because of social media, because of technology, we're so aware of how people are really feeling, right? They're putting themselves out there every day on their social media and, and you're getting a taste of what's actually going on. Things that they normally wouldn't say, you might actually catch on their social media and it, it kind of changes the way you have to approach it. You know, we talk about this labor shortage that we, we've we experienced in our industry. Well, you know, we broke a lot of people for years. I mean, most of us came up under those certified master chefs who were hardcore and had the highest expectations, whether you were in a Michelin kitchen or you were in a beautiful resort, you were going to go through the grind and you were going to put in your 16 hours and you got used and abused and you smiled about it. You know, you didn't flinch. You showed up and you went right back to work. That that doesn't exist anymore. We're, we're, we have to be more cautious because we want people to continue to be in this industry to push push the the industry forward. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That you know, the it's I think that's spot on. You know, the it's it's no wonder that the advertisements for culinary schools today don't have any of those pictures that that you know people from our generation celebrate. You know, like the the crouching down behind the line and eating dinner. I mean, we all have really fond memories of that. You know, I can remember yeah. taking a poached egg and pouring truffle oil on it and putting sea salt and inhaling it, uh, probably not just one either. Uh, you know, and we, we have those memories. And, and for us, you know, that's a bonding point for us. Uh, but I, I think that that's not what people want right now. People can't connect with that unless they were with us there, right? So um, I think it's it's important to be cognizant of that. And, you know, since since I started the coaching thing and I started to really reflect on myself and have more awareness about myself, I think a big part of it, aside from the inherent stress of the kitchen and the you know, the fire and the ticket machine and, and, and all of the demands, uh, I think time is, has been an issue, too. Right. Like that's what that's what did me in at that exam. It was like the whole journey there. I was so hyper focused on, you know, just focusing on one thing, the end result, just focus on this goal and don't do anything but get ready for this goal. And symptoms that I had leading up to the exam, I completely ignored because I never gave myself time. And the scheduling of, of kitchens, you know, has historically not been conducive to give people time to think about themselves and, and get to know themselves and, and really kind of connect with that. So I, I think that's a big part of it too. What did, what advice would you both give to, you know, cause not everybody is the executive chef or, you know, running the business and they can just, and not to say, not to dismiss that there aren't challenges when you're in those kinds of situations either, because you have different kinds of stress, but if you're kind of at the mercy of a schedule and you're in a, um, you're working in an environment that is maybe stressful, um, and maybe, you know, you might be a young chef, middle, you know, whatever, middle of the career, whatever. But like you guys have figured out ways to kind of um, redirect and kind of control um, that stress. But what are some like coping mechanisms? Like what kind of advice would you give somebody to try to get their self out of a hole if they feel like they're slipping into, you know, the, the grips of mental health and they're, they're think you get bad things going through their head or, or um, as, as you mentioned, brother luck, you know, you, you kind of just start um, thinking negatively and sometimes that can kind of also fester and you could just be one trigger away from taking it another step. But what kind of advice would you give to somebody that might be in that kind of a situation? Uh, how do you, what are some coping mechanisms? Well, I think you hit a spot on. You, you touched on schedule and, and, we go through our entire lives on a very strict schedule of, of wake up at this time, brush your teeth, go catch the bus, recess at 10 o'clock, lunch at noon, dismiss at three out of school, do your homework, go play, have dinner, go to bed. We're on a very strict schedule until we get out of our education. You know, as soon as you're out of high school, college, all, the only schedule you care about at that point now is your, is your work schedule. So you stop scheduling your lives unknowingly. We, we don't schedule our lives. And we, with, with, re, with the realization that we all have the same 24 hours, 
you have to schedule your personal. You have to schedule the time with the friends, the family, your loved ones. You have to schedule time for yourself. If you're not scheduling your, your personal life like you're scheduling your work life, you're going to have this, this, this balance that's not there. You're, you're going to break. And I, I think that's the biggest realization that I've had to accept in my life, regardless of my position or title, is I say yes and I say no. And I control my schedule. So I know when I have to work, but I also know when I, I have the ability to sleep. I know when I can get up a little earlier. I know when I'm procrastinating, when I need to put the social media down. Like All these things are me taking ownership of my schedule and controlling my schedule. And I think that's the first step to finding balance. Yeah, I, I think that uh, there are a lot of buzzwords out there uh, like balance and self-awareness and empathy and mindset and all these things. And I think everybody talks about them uh, as, you know, as, as the people we're talking about, the people who are getting burnt out in restaurants, you know, people who think that they're self-aware, people who, uh, you know, believe that they can't have better balance. Um, I think really exploring what those words mean, you know. Uh, and, and understanding what self-awareness is like self-awareness isn't just I'm I'm anxious, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm mad like that's easy. That's on the surface. Right. So self-awareness is knowing what's triggering all of these emotions that you're having um, and, and having the time. And if you don't have the ability to schedule yourself because you're kind of at the mercy of the schedule, you know, are you at a place that has an environment and a culture and a schedule that is conducive for the life that you want to lead? And you have to make that decision, you know, I mean, it's I, I think, you know, line level staff are kind of at the mercy of, of the schedule. Um, and I think this idea of work, I'm always talking about uh, the, the, the contradiction of work life balance. Um, I wish that people would stop saying that phrase and, and branding it as work life balance, because in that equation, you automatically make work the enemy of life. Right. So isn't it just like life balance? Odds. Yeah. You know, like if, if you think about it, think about all the different aspects of life that you have. You have your work life, your financial life, your social life, your sex life, all these things. Right. If I came home and I looked at my wife and I said, hey, you know, I I think I really need to figure out a better marriage to life balance. You know, like at best, I'm sleeping on the couch. Right. Because instantly I've made marriage the negative in the scenario, which is what we always classify work as in the scenario. So. If work is that daunting that you need to figure out how to separate it from the rest of your life, maybe you're at the wrong place. How do you, you know, as an employer leader in hospitality today, create a culture that embraces uh, this mindset of work-life balance and or a safe place to work? To your point, you've got so many different generations that are uh, or, or people, right. Ethnicities and, and upbringing, right. You grew up in Colorado Springs. I grew up in the sticks of wherever, right. And now we're in one place. How is that? How can you create a, uh, differentiating culture that's appealing to, uh, an individual to come work, but also, man, as a, as a diner, you can tell, like when you go and, and sit at, the table that there's something different going on in the building. Yeah. I mean, the continuous leadership training is, is nonstop, right? We, we focus on our craft so much of getting that, that knife just sharp enough, getting those cuts just perfect, making sure that sauce is reduced properly and the meat is butchered the way it should be. And it's sourced from the right farm. We focus so much on the product. Sometimes we forget that people actually matter the most. And yes. our first guest is actually your, your, your team members, right? They're the first person to walk in the door. So before I get anyone picking up a fork, my first guests are already here. So I have to train my staff, my leaders, especially, you know, we always forget the supervisors and the assistants because those are the ones that are one foot in leadership and one foot in production. We have to focus on training them to come from a place of curiosity. I don't want you to lead with intention. I don't want you to lead with aggression. I don't want you to lead with authority. I want you to lead with curiosity. I want you to ask questions throughout your day and see the responses that you get back. Because when you're coming at it that way, you're listening. And that's where I think most managers fell is they want to establish themselves as authoritarian and they don't get that most of the team members 
are waiting for you to earn their respect so they can trust you. Yeah, for sure. That I think that's great. You know, and honestly, the industry, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it kind of needs to like reinvent itself. I mean, there's, because uh, I, I don't feel like, you know, at UPS or in a lot of, you know, emergency rooms that if somebody doesn't have the right tool that they're just like, suck it up, figure it out, you know, but in the chef industry, the culinary industry, it's almost like, eh, you know, it's like a tough it out mentality. It's like, we'll figure it out, dude. You know, it's like, you you can't really do that. And I got to say, I, I mean, I, I, I've always been open and open-minded and knowing that the way I get better is I evolve, you know, I'm, I, things that I might've been right about five years ago, things have changed. The people have changed. The circumstances have changed. So we all have to, I don't want to say change, but like evolve, you all have to evolve. And when I see, I definitely feel like social media has really contributed in a lot of ways for the negative, even though there's some, a lot of positives to communicating, but sometimes I also see, I see some chefs that might, go on and voice their frustration about the generation is different and the way it used to be has changed. It's like, dude, if you are trying to create this compelling message to want people to come and work for you, you're not doing a very good job. It's just, and you're kind of telling the whole world that, you know, know, you're going to work in this really intense kitchen and it's just not very, promotional it's just not a very good you know uh picture to paint so what do you what do you guys think about like how how can you uh create like are there ideas that you have with as as guest speakers and you're going out there and you're talking with different people that want to know about where you think the industry is going do you think there are some things that you can use this as an opportunity to evolve for the better in your kitchens and maybe like what are some things you're doing in your own kitchens that are ideas to, to, to make a better culture? Like how, how, I mean, obviously talking, you know, treating people with respect, but are there other, are other like outside of the box ideas that maybe we never would have saw like 20 years ago? I, I think, uh, I, I'm sure we could both talk in length about, uh, about this <laughs> part of the topic. Um, but you know, it, it is hilarious, isn't it? Like when, when you see chefs go out there and say this, that the, the, the new generation is different, you know, it's like saying the new is new, right? Of course they're different yeah. by definition. They're different. They, they have right. a different environment around them. We didn't come up in the same thing they came up in. Right. So you could complain about it and end up either leaving the industry or being in a kitchen all by yourself, or you could connect with them and learn about them and figure out what it is that they need to be successful and, and how to support them through communication and, and active listening, you know, and actually trying to get to know what it is that makes them perform and, and want to perform for you. Um, but also, you know, giving them true equity, right? Like a word that's thrown around a lot uh, that I also think, um, you know, is not completely understood, right? Like, Equity means that you have empathy first and then you try, if you're able to, to set up a situation where that person does have an opportunity to get just as high up as anybody else in the operation. It might look different, but do they have that opportunity? In a lot of cases, no, they don't and and they should. You know, we, we have to think outside the box when we talk about creating creative environments, right? We do this for guest experience all the time. Like, how can I make this memorable, not just a meal? Well, it's the same thing with the workplace. Like, how do you change your leadership style to really get somebody to feel like they were heard, they were seen, and they're supported to be successful? And, you know, I I, I talk to a lot of my leaders about Essentially, like you're, it doesn't matter what you do. You're in a leadership position. It's the success of your team that I'm, I'm actually measuring your success on. So I want you to find ways to get them to drop their walls to have real conversations with you, just like I'm doing with most of them. You know, I, I actually like to take team members for a walk outside of the restaurant, outside of the kitchen. We go for a short walk. And now we're side by side. We're not looking face to face as boss, employer, owner to leader. We're not walking side by side and not making as much eye contact to where 
I can actually have a much more normal conversation with someone and I'm going to get a lot more out of them just walking down the street to the park or walking past the storefronts. This is, these are those pieces where we have to think, you know, extremely unique and, and how we approach getting our team to be vulnerable with us, but it has to start with us being vulnerable with them. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I was telling Rich earlier that uh, there was a podcast, Mike Tomlin, uh, I think he's still the Steelers coach. I, he may be gone, but uh, I, I heard him talk about, you know, how he empowers his people. And he said, in some regard, I have to be a therapist for every one of my athletes. And one could be a 22 year old with single with, you know, a completely different set of problems than someone that's in their mid thirties, has three kids going through a divorce. Uh, but I've got to show my own vulnerability. And I think myself as a, a leader in distribution, managing a sales team, I had to talk to one individual different than I had to talk to a different individual. And I had to uh, be able to listen and protect uh, the individual stick up for the, you know, the, the team, even if a, a chef was being rude to one of the salespeople because it was a late truck product didn't get there is like, Hey, you know, we're here to help one another. I think when they, you stick up for the individual, okay, now we're working on breaking barriers down and uh, creating that environment where, you know, sometimes like the first thing, and, and I also heard, for Amazon executives, it's like very short meetings. The first thing that you're allowed to talk about is your personal life, because if your personal life is not right, your work life is never going to be right. Right. So what you what you have going on at home, if you can't talk about that openly with your, you know, your su supervisor, your leader, and they don't know what's going on, uh, you're going to be challenged to, to direct and lead that individual. If you don't truly know that, if you just look at a person as a commodity and someone that's just there to fill a void, you're never going to get a hundred percent of their effort and their care. They're going to treat whoever they're serving at, in that manner. And I think we've all been served and have a memory of where it's like, this person does not want to be here. They don't care. Uh, and it rubs off on the overall thing. But I think one of the things in any industry, if you invest in your people genuinely and truly and care and ask questions and go for a walk or take them to lunch, know their birthday, know, you know, daughter, spouse, whoever, man, that can completely transform and create an engagement for, hey, I'm not doing well right now. Like this came up and I feel you're the only person I can talk to about it. Now, all of a sudden, the dynamics of the relationship change. You know, and honestly, too, um, I feel like one of the most fundamental things is like saying good morning to somebody can go a really long way. I can remember working with a lot of chefs over the years that would walk right past me in the hallway and like not even acknowledge me, <laughs> you know, and it's just like sometimes somebody just remembering your name or um, acknowledging you like that, that can go a long way. Um, but <clears throat> I wanted to ask you guys what your thoughts are, because you you know you've you've had experience in <clears throat> fine dining and on you know high pressure tv shows and um culinary competitions all those sorts of things but as like a i don't say a young chef but maybe somebody just starting off in the industry and they're they're kind of thinking about the direction that they may want to go in their career and in the kinds of environments do you think that the industry is is um that there's certain cultural aspects or do you think that there's different cuisines uh that impact the chef's mental health like for example maybe you know fine dining that has like traditionally carries like you know different pressure or expectations or maybe uh going into cooking competitions or do you think that just mental health really knows no i mean it could just it, it could be anywhere um what's your opinion on that I think if, you know, if there's any advice that I'm giving to a lot of this younger generation is you don't need to chase the validation, right? Uh, winning an award, being on a television show, being nominated for something, receiving the accolades, the newspaper articles, whatever it is, the validation isn't going to solve what's broken internally. Like what you've got going on inside, those insecurities, that anxiety, like all those pieces that are happening internally, no piece of validation is going to do that. You know, James Beard giving me some kind of nod doesn't solve what I'm dealing with inside. Being on Top Chef doesn't do 
any of that. I still have to show up and deal with what's going on. And I think for so many of us, like, and I, and I, I came up in that same circuit of high school level, competing on a national level, earning scholarships to actually go to culinary school, getting into that ACF circuit, like all, all of that mindset for me was about validation, right? I wanted the approval of a grown man saying good job because I didn't have that as an adolescent. And it took me years to figure that out. But most of my career was spent chasing the nod of approval from a father figure. You know, you, you have to solve what's going on internally in order to pursue something great in your career and actually be successful at it. Yeah, I, I don't think it's the place either. I, I, I'm with you there 100%. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's the place. I don't think it's the cuisine. Uh, mental health is not a diagnosis. Mental health is, is a state of being. It's, it's part of us. We all have mental health. It's either good or bad or somewhere in the middle, but it is part of us. You know, I mean, you get your, you get your oil changed every three to 5,000 miles. So your car will get you to work or wherever you have to go. You, uh, you know, you go to the doctor every year, hopefully you go uh, get your teeth cleaned every six months. Um, but you know, our, our brain, our mental wellness is something that we all have. And it's arguably, you know, the most important functioning part of our body. And how often do we check that out? You know, we do all those other things, but like, I think it really comes down to exactly what brother luck said, you know, that it is mindset and what you believe and how you view the world is ultimately how you're going to be able to handle things, you know, and, and you can recalibrate that, but you have to be, you have to be cognizant of that. Yeah. I think it, your ability to, calendar time just like you said brother earlier for meditation for a walk like you time right like find time to invest in you and maybe that's going to the gym today maybe tomorrow is like read a book uh, it, it's investment in you it's taking your wife on a date it's investing in your kids time right break up your week into you know hey i'm going to deposit time into this bucket um and additionally, because of social media, you know, we're able to digest information that we it's either going to uh, inspire us or it's going to continue to break us down. Right. You're going to either chase something that um, you're chasing for for, you know, a vanity or, or you know, I want to buy a new car. I want to I need some kind of label on me to justify me being in a group. Right. Um so your ability to follow things that are either going to push you to be better, right? So I think it's an assessment of your time and then assessment of, you know, your circle. I think we've all heard, man, you're, you're, you're a makeup of the five people you really surround yourself the most with, right? So do an audit of who are you surrounding yourself with? And sometimes you got to say goodbye to people that you shouldn't be around. No, absolutely. I got, you know, I cashed in my hundred pennies for four quarters. Like <laughs> that's where I live. And, you know, um, I also, I, what you guys mentioned, which I really haven't thought about this way, but I think it's really, um, it's, it's important because it kind of takes away, I feel like mental health, the term almost has kind of had a stigma for years. Like to say it was almost kind of like, oh, you know, it's taboo. You don't know, you want to talk about it. But the reality is, is everybody has mental health as you have other um um, types of health about you. And um, it, it is like, what's the condition of that? Where are you at in that health assessment of your, your mental state? So um, I think that's a, that's a really big takeaway. It's something to really kind of think about and really probably every kitchen needs to kind of gauge what kind of an environment am I creating? What is the, is this conducive for uh, people feeling really good about being here, or am I creating anxiety and stress? And I think anybody that's listening to this can really um, do a, a takeaway and have an assessment of wherever it is that they work and say, hey, am I putting in good or am I putting out, putting in bad into this? Uh, and then the other thing I just want to reference one of our past uh, um, guests that we had on the show uh, he is a, he's an, an author and um, also was a wild land a firefighter and the whole episode was really uh kevin Connolly was really pretty heavy and he had talked about him coping with uh mental health and 
Uh, he was contemplating taking his life and he ended up riding a bike across America. And that was the way that he kind of conquered it. But I kind of, as I was listening to him, you know, I feel like there's a lot of different things in my life that I'm proud that I've experienced. I mean, um, you know, that I've things that I've done, but I said to myself, I was like, man, I'm so impressed that, uh, and inspired by people that can talk about what it is that they're coping with. And I say to myself, like, would I have the courage to, um, talk about a, a state that maybe I needed help. And I think that after talking with you guys, it's like, yeah, you, you need to talk about it and you need, it needs to be something that there shouldn't be a stigma about because, um, it's just one of those things that needs to be addressed and the, and, and talking about it, pointing it out is something that you, you know, you need help with is kind of the first step and getting away from it being a mental health issue where it's just like, oh yeah, you've, you know, that person has like mental health issues. It's like, no, we all have a condition that we have to, we're just in different states of it. So right. that's very refreshing and eye opening. I think to, to hear you guys talk about it in that way. Yeah. And Rich, if I can, to your point, um, you and I have uh, a mentor in common uh, that, that, that took his life. Right. And I remember going to the memorial service for that and how many people were there. I mean, there, there, there had to be a couple of hundred people there. Uh, and I remember thinking two things. The first thing I remember thinking was, wow, look at all the people that this man affected positively and, 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 you know, became a, a significant part of their life, their trajectory and all that. And the second thing that I thought was, wow, look at all of the people that he could have called that yeah. no doubt would have picked up the phone. Yeah. Um, I mean, they traveled to White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia uh, to, to be there for him at that time because of how he impacted their lives. You know, who knows how that would have went if, if, if the courage was there to call. You know, there's a lot of people out there that care about you more than you realize. 19 years ago this month, my dad took his life. And um, I remember talking to him. It was Super Bowl Sunday and thinking everything was good. Next day, not good. And you just never know. Yeah, we we hide it, right? No no one no one knew what I was going through because I I gave them the perception. I, I created what I wanted them to see and I didn't let them in because my fear was I didn't want to be viewed as weak. And I also didn't want to be labeled or judged. I didn't want special you know, attention or, or someone to tiptoe around me. So I, I hit it and I thought I was just crazy for what I was going through internally. And it wasn't until I heard someone say, your story's not meant for you. Your story's meant for someone else to hear. You have to relive your pain. You have to go through your fear. You have to go through your struggle repeatedly for someone else to hear because they need those words of encouragement to persevere beyond their current situation. And, and I've taken that to heart is that one, talking about mental health does not make you look weak. Like I'm 6'2", 230. Like I'm a big dude. I'm not weak when I talk about my mental health. I'm still just as strong as I was yesterday. But it doesn't mean I'm not feeling something on the inside. So I think we have to, we have to normalize the uncomfortable, which is it's okay to talk about what you got going on. You just have to be around trusted people. And that's where we have to earn that trust from the people that we're around. Well, and that, that creating that openness that we can talk about things and, you know, Hey, we're going to get through this together. And Mike, to your point earlier uh, of uh, how many people were around, right? Like, it, it all it takes is a moment in time to make a bad decision in a bad place and mental health, like physical health, right? You can run a mile different than I can run a mile based off of how much you practice. And we practice that muscle of being right, you know, between the ears because of meditation. And I, I listen to positive podcast. I surround myself. So maybe I'm a little bit more prepared in that moment that trigger point for me is totally different than a trigger point for someone that hasn't exercised that muscle to, 
I need help or, you know, how am I coping with that? So figuring out how can you cope? Uh, what are those steps? Is it, you know, in, in the Springs, walking up the Manitou incline to, to, you know, relieve yourself? Is it jamming out? Is it drums? Is it, you know, there's so many different things, but find out what your, your lane is and then bring to, you, you said it, I tr had a hundred pennies and now I've got four quarters, you know, rather have four really good people that I can go and confide in than a hundred people that, you know, kind of know me. And, you know, you look at the inception of Facebook back in the day when it was really popular and look how many friends I have. You don't really have that many friends. Right. And, uh, one of the things I've learned, uh, maybe one of the, the, uh, best pieces of advice I've gotten from, uh, another father is like, look, you can really only manage like five friends, right? And those friends are going to evolve with you as your your kids evolve, whether that's pre-K and then you go to elementary and then from middle school and they get into choir or sports and like you're just going to have different units, but build your unit based off of, you know, trust and, and confidence and, and lifting one another up so that you can prepare for it. And I've heard a quote where it's, um, you're either uh, going through a storm, you're getting out of a storm, or you're preparing for a storm, right? Like th those are the three phases. We're all, doesn't matter how successful people are. Life is a roller coaster. You know, you just got to prepare yourselves for the highs and lows. For me, um, trying to kind of continue to be open-minded and because I feel like different, as you guys mentioned earlier, like different generations are going to have probably different ways that they kind of tackle and approach all this stuff. But um, for chefs that are maybe a little further down the runway of their career, um, I would say, you know, be open minded. And, uh, you know, I, I don't look at it as like, oh, you've got to change the way you manage things. Um, you really kind of have to be willing to evolve. And um, that whenever somebody goes into like a new kitchen, it's I remember like years ago, because I was working with all these like classically trained European chefs and stuff, not to say anything about, you know, but we all know, you know, fine dining and high end environments, they tend to be kind of pretty stressful and all that. And, um, but my, my paradigm going into a kitchen, you know, years ago, it was all focused on food and discipline and frankly, kind of almost like a militant atmosphere, but you know, you could still have the quality today, but I feel like if somebody's going in and they say, like, uh, I want to go in and change the culture, I want to improve the culture, that's kind of like uh, maybe saying I want to get in shape. But that's that's kind of maybe more the outcome or the result of what are the steps that you need to take. And I feel like after listening to some of the things you guys are talking about, it's almost like. Uh, as a company or as a leader, you've almost got to say, like, what are your values? Like, what are the things that are important to your organization? And if it's all like just food and product related, the people aren't really uh, in, in that. And it's like it's almost like you've got to really think about it more of like, well, number one, we want to respect each other, you know, show people respect, you know, like that's a that could be the f a first step, you know. But it's really kind of thinking about the outcome of the kind of organization that you want to have and what are you going to focus on, you know? And if it, and I, like I said, I've worked in kitchens over the years where it was not the people. <laughs> it was, I mean, it, it wasn't that people were trying to be mean to you, but they were just really intense environments and you got to run different plays today. And I'm glad for that because I, I want to, I, I want to get better. And that, frankly, that's why we love doing these shows because we talk to experts and people that are really doing deeper dive into some of these subjects. And, and frankly, that's, that's how you get better. That's how you evolve. And cause nobody has all the answers. I mean, as you guys are all talking, I mean, I don't care uh, anybody's experience. Um, you know, the, the, those, those examples you gave, those are, those are heavy for anybody to cope with. And um, the reality is it just doesn't, it, it, you know, it can hit anybody at any time in their life. And uh, it's never easy to cope with that stuff. But you can at least try to set this, this, the, 
environment that's conducive where people can come in and not feel like, you know, they feel like that they, they matter, you know? Yeah. You can't, you can't change the environment yeah. and you can't change people until you understand how that happened. How did they get there? How did the culture end up where it's at? You have to do the homework. You know, I, you can't talk to somebody a certain way and not understand that they have a completely different background than you, right? I come from a very urban environment and my first natural defense mechanism is to shut down and get defensive, right? And, and for me, it was violence usually as the background to what was going to occur after that. So when I'm working under chefs and they're yelling and screaming at me as a young cook, you know, that wall that goes up, goes up very quick and very intentional, but not, most of those leaders did not make the effort to understand me as a person. So, you know, now as someone in those roles, I have to make that effort continuously to personalize my experiences with all my team members. I got to know who I'm dealing with. I got to know you as a person, just like our guests don't have the same palettes. Neither do our, neither do our employees. Like their lives are all different. Yeah, you know, advice I try to I give chefs all the time um, when it comes to, you know, what our challenges are as a profession, as an industry, um, you know, food, if, if you're an accomplished chef and, and you have a, a solid repertoire and, you know, you have a following, uh, think about what you could do if you put all of the effort for, for six months or a year that you would normally put into learning more techniques and 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 new recipes right if you if you just kept your repertoire the same for six months or a year and then shifted your focus to effective communication and culture development and i mean think about where we could go uh and and how we could advance what we do you know and it's everybody looks for a quick fix for for mental health and mindset and stuff and people are reading david goggins book and and i love david goggins i got nothing nothing against him super inspirational dude right um, but you know, you read self-help books and it's like, you're trying to fix yourself, but you're reading a book written by somebody else's self about how they fix their selves. And you're, you're thinking that when you're done reading that, you're going to somehow be able to apply it to yourself to fix yourself. And it just doesn't work that way. Cause I'm not a Navy SEAL, you know, and I, I don't have the same experiences or mindset that David Goggins does, you know? So I need to take the time to figure that out for me. Yeah, I think, you know, looking at all the self-help, because I've been a big self-help, motivational podcast, book, quote, person, you know, because we touched on it a little bit earlier. If you're an executive chef at the top of your craft, who's sharpening you, right? Like when you have mentorship, uh, you know, your responsibility is to cultivate the people below you. But who's working on you, right? How how, how are you fueling yourself to, to continue and um, inspire others to, to be at their best. And if you're not at your best, you can't be at your best for, for themselves. There's a lot of, um, new tools that have kind of evolved. Are you guys seeing anything that you're putting into play in the restaurant at the club, uh, you know, for yourself from a technology standpoint, whether it's, you know, telemedicine has evolved, right. To be able to have, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the therapist that can help you, you know, on a regular basis. There's the Calm app. There's, you know, more and more things out there. But are you guys practicing anything right now that that has helped you in in business or personally? You know, I I, I loved something that actually came out of uh, COVID, which was the temperature check. Right. When we all clocked in during, you know, the, the post pandemic era in restaurants, we had to put in our temperatures. Right. How, how did you feel in the POS before you clocked in? I think that applies to every staff member as far as temperament of mood at this point. Right. Not physical health, but mental health. Where are you at right now? I, I think that's such a good thing to implement into your POS systems when you're when your staff are checking in. Right. Just to give you a pre-shift topic, you know, we had we had a couple, you know, people who were feeling feeling a little bit low today. Like what's going on? It just opens the conversation for awareness. And, you know, as we measure ourselves against social media, just realize like 95 percent of that stuff is not their life. Like this is their greatest hits. 
you can't compare your life to someone's greatest hits. They're not posting the bad stuff. They're not posting the parking ticket or the fight they got in with their spouse or like what they're feeling about what they see in the mirror. Like they're not posting any of that. They're, they're, they're posting the vacations and the trips and the TV shows and like that's not real life. So I think we have to just make sure like we maintain this this connection to reality, which is, you know, how are you really doing? How are you really feeling? And this is how I'm really doing, right? I'm not just giving you the good stuff. I love how you answered that. Because uh, I think it's it's a the concept of what you just described. It's not a tangible piece of software. It's It's not a one tool. It's not a one resource because everybody's different you know and and i think what brother luck just said i mean it's it's about learning about who they are and and what they need because you can't just have these implemented tools i mean they, there are some great things out there and they're helpful you know employee assistance programs and and things like that but at the end of the day on the day-to-day -day work when somebody's working next to you on the line who are they and you know how much do you know about that and what makes them go you know, you could tell me how the, the control board and your rationale works, probably ad nauseum. Uh, but do you know anything about the control board and the person to your left and the person to your right? And they're the ones who have to turn the thing on, you know. Well, awesome. Uh, I know we're coming up here on an hour. Uh, this is a really complex topic. And I think there's I mean, you can go <clears throat> a, a much deeper dive into a lot of different areas, but um, yeah, I definitely want to, I want to thank you guys for, you know, tackling an important topic in the industry, because I just don't feel like, you know, there, it really, we just, somebody needed to kind of like grab the attention of the industry and, and more than one person, because it's a big industry and it's kind of crazy. It's like, we've been, it's moved so lethargically and it's like been left in time compared to a lot of other industries. So uh, we really wanted to try to echo a lot of what you guys are, um, what, what you're really kind of spearheading and share this with as many people that are out there. Cause Mike, as you said, you know, there, there could be somebody that is just one step away and maybe all they need is a phone call, or maybe they just need to be able to have somebody to talk to. So I think, uh, the more people that are aware of this and, in, 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 you know, embrace it into their operation, into their day to day, into their life. Uh, it can help a lot of people and maybe even, you know, it could be people that are in leadership too, you know. Um, is there anything else that you guys, uh, anything you want to mention that we didn't cover? Uh, and also, I'd love to know uh, where can people uh, learn more about uh, each of you, uh, whether it's a website or social media? Brother? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if there's anything that I just want to kind of close with is, it's got to start with the mirror. It, it, it's got to start with the mirror. Like those conversations and feelings that you have with the mirror, you know, I couldn't make eye contact with myself for a long time because I, I didn't love myself. And that's where it's got to start. You can't help somebody else until you begin to really have honest conversations with yourself. And only you can do it. It's your 24 hours. It's your road. Like you got to be the one to, to make those calls and make those decisions. So um, I appreciate the time. I'm Chef Brother Luck uh, across the board at Chef Brother Luck. Uh, you can check me out, chefbrotherluck.com. And uh, if you haven't checked out the book, uh, please do. No luck's given. Life is hard, but there is hope. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, you get what you get in life because you think the way that you do. And I think that's a very important uh, distinction for people, you know, I mean, everybody thinks differently. Everybody, like we said earlier, has a different environment that they came up in. Uh, and you get what you get because you think the way that you do. So once you understand that, you know, there's no right and wrong. There are choices and there are results. And you make choices and there are results. And then you get to choose how you proceed after those results, you know, but it's always really a choice. Um, but yeah, for me, um, my, my website uh, for Be Better Life and Leadership Coaching is uh, BeBetterCP.com. Uh, so you can learn more about what I do there. Um, my Instagram is m one And uh, yeah, I mean, that's where I am. But uh, I appreciate being here and being with you guys. And thanks for having me. One thing to, to kind of maybe 
finish up on as I saw a quote as we were getting onto the podcast and, and talking about personal development. Uh, I kept showing up betting on myself because I'm my own best lottery ticket. And, you know, you're one step away from making progress and um, that for whatever it is that you want to do. But as you said, brother, take a look in the mirror, you know, have that conversation with yourself and know that where you are now, man, so much can change in, in three months. It can change in six months. It's just that take the first step. Well, guys, thank you very much for uh, a very important episode. And uh, we really enjoyed uh, spending time with you today. And uh, thanks so much. And look forward to seeing you in person soon, both of, both of you. Absolutely.